To my immediate right is Anthony De Rosa, who's the social media editor of Reuters, where he has a column and also is, um, presents, isn't it, for Reuters TV Tectonic. Yeah. Um, he started his career developing websites um, for the, one of the world's largest real estate companies. And then a few years ago, the New York Times um, called him the undisputed king of Tumblr. <laughs> On the far right is Steve Buttry, who is the digital transformation editor of Digital First Media. In that role, he's responsible for social media and digital engagement across many of the 800 multi-platform products provided by Digital First Media, which is accessed by 61 million Americans. Um, he is also a prolific um, and important blogger. His Buttery Diary has been voted one of the 10 best blogs on the future of the news business. I'm the Jane Martinson, the women's editor of The Guardian, um, and I have spent the last, and before that I was media editor, and I've spent the last uh, few years building the community to do with women's issues at The Guardian. The Guardian has also just recently um, introduced the Guardian Witness app, which we can talk about. Um, first of all, though, I would like to um, ask Emily uh, to give a sense of the big picture about the community, um, what exactly it means for news organisations and why it's important. And then hopefully um, Steve and Anthony can also chip in when that's finished. Um, thanks very much, Jane. Uh, hello. Um, Good to see some Columbia alumni in the uh, audience today. Excellent news. Um, community and journalism. I, I sort of go back to an era where the ideal um, interaction uh, between an audience and journalists was to be as far away as you possibly could be uh, from your audience um, and to have as little to do with them as possible. Uh, if somebody wrote you a letter, uh, you would occasionally put it in a drawer and think about getting back to them eventually uh, when email dawned um, and people would email you uh, quite, and, I, and I'm not joking about this, I, I do know of organisations that had a don't, e don't email them back policy. Um, so it, 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 you have to understand, uh, for those of you who are a little bit younger than me in the room, that, that this is, is quite a long journey that the uh, news industry has been on in a very short time. Um, I guess that kind of when I was at The Guardian uh, running the digital enterprises um, between 2000 and 2010, um, we were the first newspaper in Europe to put comments on all of its articles. We were the first newspaper in Europe to start uh, really what we thought at the time was a very open comment platform called Comment is Free. Uh, and we were distinguished uh, and admired and indeed heavily criticised and pilloried often by our own staff for having um, unmoderated comments because what we wanted to do was try and prove that you could create uh, better engagement around journalism. And we felt that every barrier we raised to that um, stopped us uh, in some way from learning something valuable from our, from, from our audiences. Uh, and it seems, again, kind of thinking back, that's uh, a very, very crude exchange um, in today's terms, this idea that you had somebody writing above the line and then even, even the phrase above the line writing and below the line response was very much the hierarchy of how news organisations chose to, if they chose at all, to interact with their audiences is how they, how they chose to interact with them. Um, the social real-time web has completely transformed all of this. Uh, you know, the advent of Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, uh, because what it's really done is, is, is make obvious uh, what community really is, which is, you know, it, 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 it's... It's not a, a, a binary discussion. It's not, it's not somebody talking to me and me talking back to them and sort of people queuing up to talk. Uh, my, my former colleague, Meg Pickard, who is a brilliant thinker on communities and engagement um, and who was head of digital engagement at The Guardian, uh, has a great sort of metaphor for this where she says, you know, people standing at the bus stop um, are not a community. 
uh, they are just sort of people standing in a line. But if something happens which is of, of, of mutual interest to all of them and they start to discuss it, then they start to sort of form a community. And I think that this is, this is again, a, a sort of a, a learning process that news has been through, which says it's actually as important to um, be part of a conversation that other people are having um, than it is to uh, seed and lead that conversation. Um, one of the questions that we've had sort of, I think, have, have, has, has come to the fore recently is really sort of why do we bother doing this at all? You know, if these things go in a kind of cyclical wave, I would say that we went through an early phase of real enthusiasm for you must, have, uh, you must have a community, you must be able to identify, discuss, and have people who are actively talking to you uh, and with you um, about your product or about the news um, or whatever. Uh, we've recently been, I think, through a phase which says two things. First of all, it's not necessarily financially beneficial now to have greater reach and more page impressions. Uh, you know, we know that the digital ad model is under a certain amount of um, stress. Uh, so you start to see questions popping up about why do we bother spending money on commenting systems? Why do we bother spending money on community managers? Why would we bother doing that? Why don't we just do what we always did, which is journalism that we fire out into the, you know, in, in, into the crowd and let the crowd do what it, whatever they want with it. I mean, I, you know, I would push back quite hard on that and say that I think there are still sort of three underpinning principles um, to community which uh, are the same whether you attach money to it or not. And I think the other, the other thing I would say is that I haven't seen any news organisations, uh, possibly with the exception of some of the work that um, Steve is doing uh, with Digital First Media, where I'm an advisor, so I have to sort of fess up to that. Uh, but I haven't seen many organisations understand what the value of community to, the, to them really is. You know, it's always counted on a pretty sort of crude metric. Um, but there are three reasons really why you would want community, one of which is to improve your journalism. Um, because, you know, you, you, I think we all know now that uh, those who work in journalistic organisations do not own the news. Uh, we don't often live where the news breaks. We're quite often second responders um, rather than first responders. Uh, we don't know everything about everything. There are people in our communities who, believe it or not, know more about subjects than we do. Uh, and having their active help and cooperation uh, in an active ne network improves your journalism. It pushes you to be better. It pushes you to correct things that are wrong. Uh, it improves your base of sources for stories. Uh, and it provides a livelier discussion. And after all, at the end of the day, if something happens and nobody reports it, it's not news. When it's reported, it's news. And news is also the, the broad discussion of these topics in, 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 in society. Um, I think the second reason that you, we want to cultivate communities is, is because we need to remain relevant. You know, uh, news organisations have been under a great deal of pressure uh, to think of business models. Um, we're not quite there yet, but the one thing we do know is that if you don't have an audience, you won't have a business model of any description. Uh, we see some interesting sort of monetization techniques. Um, I'm not going to get into the kind of pros and cons of paywalls right here, but... Uh, you know, when you think about the New York Times stabilising some of its revenues through being able to sell bundled subscriptions, not all of that is just transactions. Some of that is people subscribe to the New York Times because they have a particular feeling about it. They like to identify themselves as New York Times uh, readers or member, members of the New York Times community. Uh, if you listen to something like NPR in uh, the US or you pay your BBC licence fee, how you feel about uh, those media brands is absolutely um, key to the business model. You know, you have to maintain this, a, a level of community engagement. Um, and then thirdly, uh, I think that there's, there's also a maybe slightly more abstruse uh, reason for being um, investing in community building and investing in, in the ideas of, of, of how we as news organisations kind of recruit and cultivate communities, um, which is, you know, an active and engaged society 
has a high demand for what we do as journalists. You know, and uh, it, it, we as kind of, you know, we, we are journalists, but we're also kind of community leaders, if you like, in the communities that are interested in news. Um, that's our job. You know, we should be there uh, engaging and, and, and pushing issues uh, and making um, connections between other people in the communities and going into communities where we don't necessarily uh, belong or, or, or have been ourselves. I was talking um, a couple of days ago to somebody who works at a not-for-profit in America called ProPublica, which is very successful uh, in terms of producing very high-quality journalism. Um, and they were talking about some experiments that they're starting to do with Reddit uh, and uh, being in certain sort of sub-communities on Reddit around um, investigative journalism. So this is not about us owning and building the communities around our brands. This is also about us saying, you know, we, we don't, where we live is not necessarily where people are discussing and, and being um, involved in, 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 in news consumption, news generation. We have to go out into those networks and understand how to kind of relate, that, relate, relate what we do to what those people are talking about. Um, so I think those are the kind of the, 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 that's the broad overview. Uh, and I'll just say one other thing, which is, you know, there's a very interesting thing happening at a micro level, which is there is a, uh, a trend now, not just in sort of content uh, communities, but also in funding and finance communities. You know, it's, it's, it, there are some interesting things happening around uh, places like Bertha for um, independent filmmakers in the UK, where I originally come from, and Kickstarter. You know, these are, these are communities now of people who, who see their role in terms of uh, news as also being kind of, uh, for, sort of mini philanthropists and supporters as well. Uh, but all of that comes from an active engagement from us uh, and an involvement in those networks. Um, it doesn't just happen by accident. Thank you. Um, I'm, going to... I'm going to ask Steve to answer first um, this issue of the value of a community. But firstly, anyone standing at the back, there's two seats here and some others if you'd like to come and sit down. Um, Steve, Emily talked about the value of a community. It's not just about the financial gain, but how would you define it? You've had experience, lots of different organisations now in terms of very much community engagement sure um, I think the community that community has community engagement has financial value that is clear but not tangible I mean it's difficult to measure um, but but an example would be that um, one of one of the digital first media's first and most publicized examples of community engagement was our uh, so-called newsroom cafe uh, in Torrington, Connecticut, where we opened the community, opened the newsroom to the community. People could come in and have a cup of coffee and a roll, and and use our free Wi-Fi, use our computers to go into our archives and print out stories about their grandmother or. Whatever they could sit in on our daily news meetings, we brought you know we webcast our daily news meetings, so they didn't even have to come in to participate in that. And the economic value was that before that, before we started doing that, that was a money losing operation. Uh, it is now a profitable operation. It. it, it we became a better product for our advertising staff to sell because the registered citizen was, there was a buzz about the registered citizen in Torrington that had a, 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 a tangible, if sometimes difficult to measure value. But profit, profitable, you know, the money losing to profitable is, is where we want to go. Uh, or barely profitable to, to uh, sustainable. And, and, and so, you know, that's one example. But but and I, and I was, uh, you know, I, I would say a, a, a fourth reason, that I, and I, I loved all of Emily's reasons. But I think a, a, a fourth reason that we want to engage with the community is that it's good for the community to be engaged. It, there's benefit to the community, and a healthier community is healthier for businesses serving that community. Um, so I, I think that that is, is part of it. In, uh, in our newsroom in, 
Pottstown, Pennsylvania, the Mercury. Uh, Nancy March, the editor there, and, and uh, Diane Hoffman, the engagement editor, and, and uh, uh, Eileen Faust, the online editor, and some really creative reporters, Evan Brandt and Brandy Kessler and some others, have engaged the community in ways that, I mean, they, they were covering issues in the community, but they were also improving the community along those lines, and, and perhaps in some ways that might make some journalists uncomfortable. Um, Evan Brandt did a story about uh, the um, food pantries for the poor in the community that were not, uh, that were running out of food and laundry detergent also. Food and laundry detergent were, were the big things that they, they gave to the poor in the community. And they were running out. And Evan did this story and then Brandy said, well, why don't we do something about that? And they have a community of local bloggers uh, that they call Town Square that they feature on their site and do events with and have relationships with. And, and so they partnered with the Town Square bloggers to uh, collect and have the community, you know, encourage the community to donate food for these uh, food pantries and collected more than 20,000 different food and laundry items for the, the needy in the community. Um, and then they followed that up with a community cleanup th project and a community um, uh, uh, literacy campaign. Um, these were all issues that they reported on. Uh, there, there were straight news stories, but also advocacy editorials and columns and blog posts and those sorts of things. And then getting in and being active, they were a collection point for the food and laundry detergent and everything. And, and those were good things for that community. And, uh, uh, you know, so, so I think the benefits are, are multiple, both for the organization and for the community. And a healthy community is good for a healthy news organization. Um, can I just ask before going on to Anthony, that example in Oakland that you talked about of going from um, money losing to profitable, sure. was that because it, you talk about the community, but at the bottom line, was that because it, it, there was more traffic, that there was sort of ad revenues, I, was it? It, it? it was multiple things. I, I, you know, part of it is we're doing a bet, our digital first focus is not just news and it's not just community engagement, it's doing a better job of selling digital. Uh, yeah. So, so we were doing a better job of selling, but we also had a product that the community cared more about. And, and if, you know, if, if you're a declining newspaper, one of the reasons they did the Newsroom Cafe was that the, um, the building they were in was dangerous. I mean, it was literally condemned, not, you know, so that, that they had to move. I think it was condemned actually after they moved. But... They knew it was a bad situation. They had to move, and they moved into an abandoned factory, uh, which tells you something about the community, that they've got this open abandoned factory close to downtown that they were, and so it had all, all of this room, and they said, well, let's invite the community into this. So they went from that dying newspaper, which is almost redundant, you know, and the people know it, uh, to in this crumbling building to this business that's, you know, giving new life to a, an abandoned building and inviting the community in to have a cup of coffee and see some art. They had an artist of the month that was featured on the wall and those sorts of things. Um, and so, yes, it did drive traffic, but it made it a better place to advertise. It, I'm sure it sold print copies, too. It, it made... The register citizen, instead of a, being a dying newspaper, it was an important part of the town, and who wouldn't want to mm -hmm. buy an ad in that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Anthony, I think, actually, you need to turn yours off, Steve. Uh, okay. to All right. <laughs> one at a time. <laughs> Hello. Um, one of the things um, we've, we've sort of touched on, the, the whole value of community, mm -hmm. but obviously you um, started off developing websites, you've worked for some of the biggest, uh, most financially um, important companies like Merrill Lynch in your career. Um, talk us through the idea of how communities build, um, build revenues, 
how can it make money? Is it just about the sort of, you know, the, the uh, engagement and the journalism of the future um, in your role at Reuters? Well, I would also echo what Steve said, is that it doesn't have a direct, tangible um, money generation that you can point to and say, we generated X amount of dollars from community. Uh, I think it's sort of a halo effect that the organization gains um, that people think that this mm. organization listens to what I have to say, also finds what I have to say valuable. Um, what we do with community at Reuters is more often uh, using our community as a source of information. Um, we've often reached mm. out to our community to get their uh, feedback about things that are happening where they live, uh, experiences that they're having because they happen to reach out to us uh, either through comments on our website or in social media sites because they're um, involved in long-term unemployment. Uh, there was a story that one of our reporters, Rhonda Schaefer, uh, who was uh, doing a report on people who had basically dropped out of the workforce because they've become so um, disappointed by the prospects mm -hmm. and the availability of jobs. Uh, that they're no longer uh, actively looking for jobs, and she wanted to seek out those people. So mm -hmm. she crowdsourced uh, and, and asked people through our social media channels and also um, looked towards groups where people were gathering and discussing the fact that they're no longer actively looking mm -hmm. for jobs. Um, so it, it's a lot of um, reaching out to the community and finding out who they are, what, they, what, what their situation is, um, how that overlaps what we're reporting on. So they become part of the story and they're not just people right. that happen to be reading what, what, what we're uh, producing at Reuters. Um, actually today we're uh, talking a lot about the FAA and um, how uh, the cutbacks in a lot of the uh, sequester uh, repercussions and how that's affecting travelers. So we want to find out from people who are, who are having all sorts of um, inconveniences because of that and integrating that into our stories. And, and that becomes directly part of the editorial that we do. So it's not just like sitting off to the side. The community just doesn't just sit off to the side and it's over in the corner and that's happening over in the comments. The comments themselves, you know, what we try to do a good job of keeping the, the quality level high. Um, we do do a, a, a bit of moderation and the moderation is taken very seriously. Uh, in fact, as our new website will roll out, we'll feature some of the best comments along with all the other content, uh, the, the articles that we're producing, um, things on social media. If people are, are posting a tweet uh, that we think is uh, specific to what we're reporting on and it, and it, it, it adds some, some valuable commentary, that'll be sitting alongside you know, an article in a stream of uh, stories about uh, sequester or Syria or, or whatever else there is. So community is no, the, the way we see it, it's not just sitting off to the side. It's going to be integrated completely into, you know, all the other er editorial that we're doing. And I would echo what Emily said is it's a good check and balance <coughs> on what we're reporting because um, they may know more than we do about certain situations. Uh, we may get something wrong. We don't, we don't we're not right 100% of the time and someone might call us out and in the past, there's always been this sort of adversarial relationship uh, between the journalist and the commenters. And the journalists never wanted to wade into the comments. They don't want to even acknowledge that the comments exist. They just don't even <laughs> want to look at what's in there. It, it, it scares them. Uh, but uh, we as uh, social media editors and community managers have tried to make them feel a little bit more comfortable about that. Mm -hmm. uh, some journalists now are a lot more comfortable uh, with the comments and sometimes they actually go and look to see what kind of feedback they get from it or if they even get some leads or sources or information that can forward the, uh, further their stories. Um, people have come to us um, and said, we have a source who could potentially move this story f uh, further uh, who commented on one of our articles, but we want you to help us vet uh, this information out. Right. Uh, we also need you to uh, tell us whether or not you can give us their contact information uh, yeah. so we can reach out to them. So, you know, there's all sorts of processes that have to be followed, but there is direct interaction uh, oftentimes between mm -hmm. the, the, the people that are commenting and the, and the journalists that are producing the articles. So to go back to your question about monetization, I would say no, there isn't a direct 
correlation that you can point to about the, how much uh, revenue it generates, but I think overall um, it creates uh, a, a idea that you are listening to what they have to say, and that is going to have a tangible effect right. at the end of the day that, that's gonna make your organization more valuable and more respected. Um, I'd like, actually I'll put that in the middle, actually, unless you, you share that one. Oh, sure. We'll just leave this on, I think. Okay. Um, I, one of the things you... Lean in. <laughs> the, the, the thing that Anthony was talking about with journalists um, not wanting to go below the line and um, sort of engage in a very direct way with some of the comments. I mean, that obviously um, was one of the big <laughs> issues when, uh, I should say here that um, in her last, uh, in her last um, iteration at The Guardian, she also wrote a weekly column, which I edited marvelously because it's <laughs> to this day still I'm the sorry. column I had the least <laughs> to do with. It was so fabulously worded. Um, but I mean, that was always the issue, how you engage. Mm. Do you think that's better? Yeah. Well, okay, sorry. We're, we're not allowed to share. That, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no nice, sharing. Nice no try. Community. <laughs> um, I just, sorry, for anybody who didn't hear, has it got better, the engagement below the line um, between journalists and people that are commenting, well, which well, Anthony mentioned? Well, two things. I think, first of all, it's changing completely. So, um, you know, I wonder how much longer we will see what we might call conventional kind of comment threads actually, you know, attached to pieces will, will, will go on for. I mean, having said that, I think when they work well, they work fantastically well. There was an amazing piece of journalism in the New York Times um, uh, last year about a very, very exclusive private school in New York called Horace Mann. Uh, and the writer wrote uh, extensively about um, sexual abuse that he had suffered there and went back and interviewed other, um, uh, you know, he, he's somebody who left the school kind of 20 odd years ago. And it was an amazingly uh, affecting piece. I was fascinated to, to see that the comments immediately underneath were both contained, um, you know, allegations about other instances. Uh, they contained a lot of really sort of difficult testimony from people who uh, had suffered abuse themselves. And I talked to a senior editor at the New York Times and said, you know, my God, did you, how, did you, how did you even think about, you know, how, and they said that, you know, it was a very, very difficult decision. They, they, they said that they didn't um, pre-moderate, that obviously there were, although I think they, pre, sorry, they did pre-moderate, but there were certain... Uh, they took the decision to post a lot more of the, the pieces. And, and you read the, the pieces of totality and, and certainly kind of the journalism with testimony attached to it is much, is, 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 is makes, really amplifies the power of the, of, of, of the overall piece. So I think there's still a place for it, but actually we're seeing a kind of a move away from this idea of just a sort of a, street, a stream of comments. Um, I think that Gorka, uh, which is Nick Denton's digital um, company in New York, has always had, uh, some, not, not always entirely successful, but has always had a really interesting attitude towards trying to blur the line um, uh, in terms of conventional ways in which they use uh, community. And I mean, two things there, one of which is uh, this idea that instead of just a threaded comments, you, you elevate the most relevant and useful comments, you redesign the page so it feels more like part of the piece. Um, on one of, Gaw one of Gawker's sites, uh, Jalopnik, there's an experiment currently working with something um, called Kinja, which I'm, I don't know how completely kind of successful it is yet, uh, where not only can you comment on articles, but you can actually annotate. Uh, so if you go to a picture of somebody driving a car, you, you, can, you can sort of embed your comment, if you like, in the picture, and the little pin will pop up. Uh, those um, comments that you post can be turned into fully-fledged blog posts. The same thing is happening with BuzzFeed. The same thing has happened with a numerous um, media organizations, you know, in the States who are now looking at, you know, you think about 
Deadspin and um, Bleacher Report uh, and a lot, lot of kind of communities who now encourage uh, not just response but, but active journalism as well. Um, you know, you, you can create a feed, you can create your own page on BuzzFeed uh, and you can post material to it and if it gets picked up by a BuzzFeed editor and featured on their front page, you can become one of their top 50 contributors. And, you know, there's a kind of, I think this idea of just sort of, just, just writing and response mm -hmm. is, you know, in some ways, it, it, it's, the most, it's the most obvious and simple. But I think we're kind of moving away from that model a little bit. And it's not a wholly bad thing mm -hmm. um, in terms of how do you actually keep your comments um, how do, you, how do you keep high quality comments and commenting on pieces? We found, uh, again, Meg Pickard conducted a really um, very uh, simple experiment with commenting at The Guardian several years ago, where we discovered that the only thing which had a significant impact on improving the quality of comments was if the author of the original piece of journalism that people were commenting on got involved in the comments within the first five comments. I don't know why it's five, but it is. It's like if you're, if you're in there early enough, you actually change and affect the tone of the conversation. And it's almost like people sort of are, oh, hang on a second, you're here. Uh, and I think that that's why, you know, the communities that now exist on Twitter, the communities that exist on, you know, kind of Facebook, uh, Reddit, um, other social platforms are now places where journalists are sort of going into those communities rather than expecting them all to necessarily sort of, you know, to live on their own site. So I think, it, you know, I think it's both getting better, but it's also kind of getting messier. Um, and, you know, we, we saw last week in the States uh, a huge amount of information about the Boston bombings being swapped among communities which had no journalistic intervention whatsoever. Mm. You know, you had subreddits with people listening directly to the police scanner, picking pieces of information off it, sharing it among themselves. It sort of popping up, if you like, later in the feeds of uh, journalists. A lot of the information was wrong. Um, one piece of information kind of, you know, critically wrong. There's been a lot of back and forth about that in the States about, you know, kind of, well, this just proves, you know, kind of that Reddit is a terrible place, uh, which is not a very useful way to think about it. Uh, you know, a more useful way to think about it is, is, is if as journalists we want to kind of improve discourse and the quality of news, then I, th I think it's, you know, I think it's beholden to us to be involved in those mm. communities as well. That, the debate about the, um, what happened with the Boston bombing, um, the sort of, the, the lack of control, the issue of whether or not the sort of law enforcement, it, you know, how much of that discussion do you think, I mean, that's just a healthy part of any democracy where you have a multiplicity of voices, and how much is it something that news organisations that are including that community should act on? Anybody who, I've, I've been in the news business over 40 years, and so, so, so I covered a lot of, a, a, fair, a fair number, either as a reporter or editor, of stories pre-digital pre in communities where, you know, n nothing as dramatic as, as the, the, uh, the Boston Marathon thing, with possible except, exception of, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, which was very early in digital times, where lots of rumors and just absolute, you know, outright bullshit circulated on on the rumor mill, and the journalist's job was to track those down and f verify the ones that were truthful and and elaborate on those, and sometimes. It, and I remember specific arguments with editors who would say, you know, we don't report on rumors. And I would argue, okay, but this one is so big and it's wrong that we need to report that it's wrong. Yeah. And I didn't very often win that argument, but I did a couple of times. And, and now we, we absolutely have to do that. Okay, that was wrong. That guy didn't do it. It was, you know, or those yeah. two guys that were on the cover of the New York Post and those sorts of things. Um, but 
reporting the news in breaking stories has always been a messy situation. Um, but as, as somebody said in an earlier panel today, the curtains come down. Now the public sees mm -hmm. it, and, and we need to try to elevate it. But you know, if anybody knows how to put Pandora, you know, back in the box mm -hmm. and go back to the pre-digital days, uh, and you know, do without all this Twitter and Reddit confusion, you're still going to get the confusion. It's yeah. just going to be on the on the grapevine instead of on Twitter and Reddit. Are you among those that think, though, as you say, the curtains come down, we can see that Oz is actually just a sad little man. Um, are you among those that think that eventually we won't need anyone but the people doing the community? Because the communities themselves will know who to trust. There won't be any mediated role. The role of a journalist, you know, we are all journalists now. You can, you want me to? Well, both. But yeah, I was thinking. Well, I, I think there's always... It you know, always is a long time for, for as far down <laughs> as I can see around the next corner. I, I, I think there remains and will remain value in providing some meaning and sense and verification. You know, I'm hearing all of these things, what is true? Now, now and if, if the professional media are just part of the chaos of stuff that's not true, then we lose some value. Yeah. But I, I think for the foreseeable future, there will continue to be significant value in being the credible source that, that, that sorts it out and finds out what's really true. Mm. That's me. I think the difference between the crowd, which can be very useful, and there's going to be bits of information there that could potentially move stories forward that a journalist somehow wasn't able to get to. Um, the difference between that crowd and the, the, the journalists who are the traditional reporters is that the reporters have skin in the game. And if they're getting things wrong, there's a huge amount of consequences for that. The crowd, it, they can put out all sorts of rumors, speculation, uh, incorrect information. There's very little, of, little for them to lose. Um, so that's why I, th I still think uh, the, the professionals or even the semi-pro, the people who are trying to make their way into the professional realm who may not be working for an organization but are doing it in a independent capacity, have very high standards. I don't believe that you have to work for a traditional organization to be a good journalist or a good reporter, but you have to have standards of what you will report on and how you'll conduct yourself. And if you have skin in the game, you aren't, you're not going to do the same things that the crowd is going to do. So I think there's always going to be a need for both sides. Sure. Um, I will come to questions in five minutes or so. But sort of following on from that, one of the criticisms of this sort of um, community journalism, <coughs> Oakland and other um, experiments that we've had, is that it's really the use of unpaid labor. I mean, that's a, that's a constant thing in the UK um, with the, the union. I think in Italy there's been sort of union voices saying, well, if we're just using the community, if we're using our neighbours, they're not being paid. That's just media organisations making use of the unpaid labour. Um, that, what's your response to that, Steve? Well, I, um, first of all, I think there's a significant difference between, and, and we see too much of uh, news organizations, you know, with unpaid internships and, and almost abusive relationships with freelancers that, that, that I think is a different situation from engaging with the community, with people in the community who want to tell their story, and, and in many cases because they have the tools of publication are telling it anyway, and we're curating that and amplifying it. I don't think that is, you know, when I went out and interviewed a source, and of course we've had, you know, different, different standards and scandals and stuff about paying for interviews and those sorts of things, but when I went out and interviewed a source when I was an old school reporter, um, that person was in effect doing some work for my newspaper because they were giving us content and, and information that had value that we made money from. Um, 
but it would have been scandalous for me to pay that person for that interview. And, uh, you know, so, so I think that, you know, if it's somebody, you know, if, if uh, well, let's take the case of at A. Kitts, the, the guy who, who uh, t live tweeted the, mm. the shootout on the street below his, his uh, uh, apartment or home uh, in Boston. He was just doing that. Yeah. It was, oh my God, look what's going on. And he's tweeting like yeah. crazy and taking pictures and, and really doing a hell of a good job of reporting. Um, he's not working for anybody. He's not working for Twitter. I mean, he's, he's using Twitter, uh, uh, but he's not working for any of the news media that curate that or that use that as a reason to go and interview him. I saw him quoted a lot. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, you know, I, I think the the question of whether they're, we're exploiting them. Yeah, of course we're exploiting them, like we've always exploited sources. Um, but I don't see it as free labor. Um, there are people who, in the community who blog. We, my, um, a lot of our newsrooms have blog networks, and part of my job is to encourage people to do blog networks and help coach them in doing that. These are people who are already blogging, or already want to tell their story, and we're kind of amplifying that. We get some benefit from that. Some of them don't blog on our site. Some of them do blog on our site. Some of them, we just steer traffic to them. But we get some benefit from that, that but so do they. And the benefit might just be ego. Some of them may have advertising you know, through Google Ads or something else, or selling ads, and we drive more traffic for them so they get some benefit. So I, I think there is benefit that they get and if there's not, then they're going to stop. Yeah. Um, are there any questions from the floor? If you could put your hand up and say who you are, and uh, that would be very handy. I think there's a microphone coming round. This man in the front. Anyone else? So, is there one mic or two? Is it? I think it's just one mic. Is it? Is it? Is the is the mic working? Hi. That's fair. <laughs> My name is uh, Luca Conti. I have a question for Anthony. I know you are very active on Tumblr, and in Italy, almost uh, no news organization uses Tumblr. So, uh, do you think uh, it could be useful as a community from a news point of view? Yeah. Tumblr, I feel like, is more about trying to highlight uh, good content that you're seeing others on Tumblr create, as, along with just using it as a showcase for the content that you're producing. But from a community standpoint, you're basically pointing to other people and saying, hey, this is a really interesting thing that you produce, whether it be a video, a blog post, uh, a really interesting photo. So what I think we're trying to do on Tumblr and what other news organizations are doing are um, are, 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 are celebrating this idea that it's, it's a uh, collaborative effort in the process of producing journalism. Uh, I think what you'll be seeing more from Reuters in the future is that it's not just about what Reuters is producing, but we're also pointing at other people and saying they produced a great piece of journalism here, you should look at this. And I think Tumblr is the first kind of you know, uh, activity that we've done that showcases that type of journalism, the collaborative effort, the, the idea that we can say the New York Times did something really interesting or just some, some person that we, uh, who may be an amateur journalist or just a community member to produce something on Tumblr that did, uh, that's really interesting. So it's, it's, it's taking all those different components and putting it out there under the Reuters banner and saying, we think this is great, you should take a look at it. And, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a real wide array of, of sources and, and information, which is what I think the whole ethos of what Tumblr is. Any more questions? The man at the back, the black. Si, buonasera. Questo panel si intitola... Oh, sorry, hang on, two okay. seconds. I got it. Um, 
Questo panel si intitola Costruire comunità. Io penso che però ci sia differenza tra aprirsi alle, com aprirsi alle comunità esistenti, interagire con loro, eh, mettersi all'ascolto e costruire una propria comunità. Credo che sia uno step successivo. Volevo chiedere se questo step è necessario e come si passa dall'apertura verso le comunità alla costruzione di una comunità propri propria alla costruzione di una comunità propria e se questa può avere un valore anche commerciale. You know, I think I think we have our best opportunity. It's very difficult to actually create a community, but you can engage communities that already exist. Um, i already said I, I started in the news business more than 40 years ago and, and I worked at a small town paper in Iowa uh, called the Evening Sentinel, may it rest in peace, uh, of about 4,000 circulation and there was an old guy, he was in his 80s named Bob Tyndall, whose job was to, he would take phone calls from all the busybodies in town who, who had gossip about somebody who was visiting or somebody who was sick and in the hospital and those sorts of things. And at that tender age of 16, when my journalism career started, I, I was already scornful of that because I was going to go off and, you know, kick ass and be an investigative reporter and all that kind of stuff. And I was very scornful of this insignificant stuff that Bob was gathering about the community. Um, and, and I did, you know, I went off and kicked ass and was an investigative journalist and all that, but um, three years ago, a little over three years ago, uh, actually been almost four years ago that he got sick, uh, a nephew of mine uh, who was, was 15 at the time uh, was diagnosed with leukemia. And uh, a community formed of people who, who wanted to know what was going on with Patrick. Uh, and this was illness was, a, was one of the things that Bob Tyndall used to gather for the Evening Sentinel. Um, and the biggest, news of, the biggest news source for me every day was going to a site called Caring Bridge where They didn't build a community. There would have been a group of people caring about Patrick's well-being, um, no matter what. But Caring Bridge gave that community tools and a way to connect. Patrick's father, John Devlin, for, felt, I, th I think, uh, had a, a lot of therapeutic value from telling people on Caring Bridge what they were going through or who did something kind for them or about their latest visit to the hospital. And Patrick went through hell and eventually ended up dying uh, of, of leukemia. And because somebody created tools and made them available, there was this community of certainly more than 100 people, hundreds of people getting in touch and finding out what was going on with Patrick and with his family throughout the illness and beyond after his death. And his, his sister went through some health issues, although she is, she is doing fabulous now. Um, but those communities already exist, but there is value, and it's value that news organizations used to do back when we had Bob Tyndall taking calls from the busybodies. And... And most of the news organizations I work for don't do anything like that now. But that was my most important news source every day for almost a year. And, and I think that we need to look for what are ways that we can help communities that already exist connect in more meaningful ways. Uh, and there's you know, similar things around happy occasions. I've got a, a niece who's getting married next month, and she's got a website and a wedding page. They had a shower on Facebook and all of this kind of stuff going on. Uh, that's one of the th reasons Facebook has been so successful is that it, it helps us connect. I'm a member of the high school class of 1972 in Shenandoah, and, 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 and we are old farts. About a quarter of my class has died. Um, But for our 40th reunion last year, we were connecting on Facebook and getting together. And, and I actually physically met, I didn't make the reunion, 
but I physically met during the year before the reunion with two classmates I hadn't seen in decades. And it's because Facebook gave us community building tools for the class of 72 to get together. That was a group that already existed. I used to get mails from them about, you know, actual snail mail saying, our 20th reunion is coming up. And I didn't go to that reunion. I didn't connect with anybody. But because Facebook built better tools, we're connecting now. So I think our success is, can we enable communities that exist to have more meaningful engagement than they ha currently have? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I uh, misunderstood or understood the end of the question about individuals creating their own communities around them, particularly individual journalists. Um, I see this as an inevitability. You know, the, the power um, is shifting from that of the brand and the institution into, you know, the hands of the individual. Um, I wouldn't go as far as somebody who uh, said to me not that long ago, uh, there should have really only be one question for journalists when you interview them for jobs, which is how many followers. Uh, and I don't think we're quite ready for that, and I, I don't know that it's the right metric to measure journalists by. Um, but one of the things I tell my students is, you know, if you have your own community of active followers uh, on whichever social platform it may be, it might be Pinterest, um, God help you, um, or it may, be, it may be Twitter or Facebook or whatever, um, and you are in competition with another journalist for a job and everything else is equal, and one of you has an active and visible following and the other one doesn't, I will guarantee you that the person with the active and visible following will get the job. I will guarantee it. Uh, it is, there's no, no question that however news editors may or may say that it doesn't, doesn't affect things, it really, really does. Um, and I think increasingly this idea of not just sort of, it, it's not just marketing yourself, it's, it's doing your work in public. You know, it's doing all of your work in public as a journalist and being that kind of signal um, within the community uh, is, is something that's now just part, going to be part of our jobs. You know, we have to exercise a lot of real-time judgment around it and you have to decide what to kind of make public and what to keep private and you have to protect your sources in that world. But, you know, it's, it, it, there's no point in being... I mean, I'm not heartbroken about it. I think it's a good thing. It's no point, there's no point being heartbroken about it because I think it's, it's happening. So to, to the point of how do you grow that from a, you're starting from zero and you're trying to build a community from there. Um, it sounds cliche, but the most important thing is that you're listening to the people who are out there. If, you have, if you're just starting out, there's, there's no one listening to you. So you have to go out and actively get involved in conversations and look for communities where you can add value to them. Like Steve was saying, there's these micro communities that exist all over the place. So if you have different skills or you have different interests or knowledge about different things, go out into those communities, add what you can to it, and then invite people back to wherever your central place is that you do your blogging or you, you tweet or if Facebook is your platform of choice, invite them back there and say, well, I, write, I wrote an interesting post, maybe you wanna give me feedback on it here. Um, but and when you're starting out, you really have to go to where the conversations are happening before you can have the conversations centrally on your own Plat platform or you know whatever wherever you do your your uh, main mode of communication. So my advice is to get get out and and speak to as many people as you can in different networks and try to bring those networks into your network. Is it? Oh, there's a man there. Just just before that, is it important as a sort of ancillary to that? What platform you're using? I mean, you talked about we each have different views about whether we use Twitter. I love Twitter. I hate Facebook. Obviously, Emily doesn't like Pinterest. Um, you know, does it matter if you're on all of them at the same time, or is it just one? What would you sort of say to people? You know, what's the most important thing? I don't think it matters. Whatever you feel comfortable with, whatever uh, works for you. I don't find Google Plus particularly um, worth no. my time. But they, <laughs> believe it or not, there does are. Does anyone hands up who finds Google Plus worth their time? Oh, so, oh. see. Like I, I was about to say, I, there are people I know who find <laughs> Google Plus incredibly valuable. Anthony Quintano, who works for NBC, um, 
I asked him, I want you to sit down with me and show me why you find Google Plus so valuable. So I'm going to meet with Anthony soon, and he's going to show me why he, he finds Google Plus so valuable. So I think it really matters on the person. Everybody's different. Emily just asked whether it was because they were paid by Google. I don't think he is, but I'll, I'll find out when I sit down and talk to him. How about you, Steve? Why Google Plus? Um, Google Plus is, is, is not, you know, it was before it came out, there was, oh, you know, Google's trying to develop this Facebook killer. And it doesn't have the text conversation. It, 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 it shocks me when I, because I usually post my blog posts to Google Plus as I do with everything else, you know, as Facebook and Twitter. And if there's a picture, I put it on Pinterest and all that. And, and it almost shocks me when somebody comments on it on Google Plus or Plus Ones that I think, oh, shit, there's people out there. But, um, <laughs> but, Hangout is really uh, good. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, and, and so, you know, you can do a live interview on Hangout and stream it on your site using YouTube. So my, my answer to your question about do you need to be on all the things is, no, you don't really necessarily need to be on all the things, but you need to understand the things and you need to be experimenting with new things. I'll give you a couple of examples. When, how many of you are on Google Voice? Uh, okay, not a lot of not a lot of Google Voice. When Google Voice came out, it was it was billed as you know a voicemail service that's gonna gonna turn your your voicemails into text and and a lot of the buzz about it was the funny garbling of of the messages that came out and those sorts of things. But Karen Workman, um, a colleague of mine at Digital First, she was at the Oakland Press at that time, but now she's at our Thunderdome newsroom in New York. Karen thought about how to use that to do better journalism, and she set up a Google Voice box for their community to call in answering questions so that we would collect audio from the community. And when, the, when football teams play in the United States, we don't get any video from that because the NFL and the networks own the video rights to that, so we can't go and shoot videos. But we do shoot still pictures, and what she would do was say, how did you think the Lions did? Or, you know, call in your, your reactions to the Lions game. And Lions fans would call in, and she would make that the soundtrack for a slideshow of our still pictures about the Lions game. So suddenly we had a video on the Lions game that didn't violate the NFL's uh, rights. So, so I think it's important for journalists, when you see something new out there, yeah. to start thinking, okay, how can I use this as a, as a journalist? If you're covering breaking news and you're not on Twitter, you're going to get your ass beat, period. Um, but, you know, does everybody have to be on Pinterest? No, but Brandy Kessler, one of my colleagues uh, that I mentioned earlier at Pottstown, Pennsylvania, uh, created, and it's not at all what Pinterest is. Pinterest is mostly about food and fashion and, and decorating and things like that. But she made like a wanted poster. She, she, got the, she was a cops reporter and got the local police departments to send her, you know, I mean, they're public records, they had to send her. She got the mug shots for outstanding warrants um, and created a pin board that was just the, the want, local wanted fugitives. And they're not murderers, they're people who wrote bad checks or, you know, wanted for theft and, you know, those sorts of things. We had a the, the local police departments had a 58% increase on arrests on outstanding warrants because she did this on Pinterest. Now, she also interfaced it with Facebook, which has a bigger audience and those sorts of things. But, you know, I think journalists should look into new tools and see how can I use this effectively to do better journalism. Yeah. And in some cases, the answer is going to be um, I can't. But somebody might think of something with Google Voice or Pinterest that you didn't think of, and you should steal those ideas. <laughs> okay. Sorry, the man there waiting patiently. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Matthew Ingram from Gigom. Hey. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Hi, Anthony. Hi, Emily. Um, I wanted, to, maybe you guys have talked about this already. Everybody should I, listen to Matthew's uh, keynote tomorrow. <laughs> Is it tomorrow or whatever? Yeah, yeah. tomorrow. Okay. You may have talked about this already. I came in late. But when you're talking about dealing with communities, <clears throat> Obviously, some communities will have their own idea about what type of behavior is, is appropriate or not. I mean, we saw what happened on Reddit, for example, during the Boston bombings. If you're trying to engage with a community, whether it's on Twitter or your own platform or Facebook, 
how do you manage sort of their, what they want to do with that community versus what you want to do with that community? Yeah, I'm changing that. Um, well, I, I go back to the fact that when they're coming to our page, whether it be on Facebook or uh, the comments on Reuters.com, they're coming to our house and they're basically guests and we're having a dinner party and we can decide who can be part of the dinner party or the cocktail party and who cannot. Um, we don't want to censor people. We want to pe give people a chance to, to speak their minds and, and say uh, what, they, what they feel. But there's a certain level of, you know, are they adding to the conversation? Are they providing something that's, um, that's gonna, that someone who's reading the article is going to gain some, some, some information from, uh, for lack of a better term? I, I think we have a certain level of decorum and, and, uh, and have a standard of what we want people to, to contribute. And if we think that they're, you know, just kind of doing graffiti for, for, for the most part, that, that's, that's the stuff that's just not gonna fly on the pages. I and mean, we, we, we want the comments and we want the, uh, whether they're on our website or they're on social networks, to, to be a place where people go to as much as they go to the articles. And if we can, we can get to that level, I think that's gonna make our readers uh, come back and wanna go into the comment section. That's really the goal, is to make the comments um, worthwhile reading for everyone that comes to our website. It's a difficult and um, time-consuming process. Um, and if you wanna take Reddit as an example of that, if, if people are just putting out names and pictures of individuals and saying this person um, committed this crime without having any basis for that, and they're not law enforcement, they shouldn't be uh, doing vigilanteism, you know, that's uh, a perfect example of a comment that is not something that we w would want to provide a platform for. Do you want to answer this? Go yeah, I was going to say that I think that um, this issue of like how you behave within the community, sometimes even on your own sites. I mean, you know, we used to get where, where a community has formed um, and they are interacting with each other, whether you have any kind of, as it were, proprietorial rights over them or not, they very much view it as, as their domain and their um, uh, material. Uh, so, for instance, you know, if you pull things, you know, randomly out of talk threads or from notice boards that you may be hosting, uh, it's still quite a shock to the actual community to, to, to see you doing that. You know, we, we've seeded Flickr groups in the past um, to get people to donate, uh, or not donate, but to get people to post photos. Uh, there's a qualitative difference between that doing that in a, in a Flickr group and somebody sort of a photo editor coming and taking the pictures out of that group and printing them in a newspaper, for instance. Um, I think that you know one of the interesting things is that, that we we saw in the states uh, between two fairly sort of systemically shocking events for America, one of which was Sandy Hook that happened uh, in December with the um, shooter in the uh, uh, the elementary school in the 26. Um, uh, deaths and then the Boston bombing was that we saw how communities learn so first of all you know we saw that in fact um, they learn in both kind of you know sort of very positive ways and also in ways which can then lead to kind of more trouble so uh, very few people were listening to the police scanners when Sandy Hook happened uh, many, many sort of, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people were listening directly to police scanners when Boston happened and they were sharing that information. But also, when Sandy Hook happened, you had a lot more, um, if you like, sort of uh, random pieces of information being disseminated and retweeted uh, before they were necessarily checked, which, which actually, you know... It, when, when Boston happened with the, you know, on a, a, the unfortunate incident of the, the misidentification of the student, I saw a great deal more uh, caution and questioning among those communities itself. And that's where journalists can actually have an influence. 
Um, but it's important that you have the right tone and that you realise that it's not your community, it's their community. But also you realise that, you know, nine times out of ten, they kind of, if you have something valuable to help them with, they, they want to, to learn from it as well. You know, they, may, they might reject you out of hand, but, but not normally, as long as you have the right approach and the right tone. Mm. Um, some, something I would say that, that matters a lot and it kind of follows up on what they said is if, if, if the conversation is on your site, it's a completely different thing than the conversations you join out in the community on somebody else's. Um, it, it, you know, context matters. You know, I've, I, I used a, a few uh, foul words in, in my earlier comments. You know, I'm in a group of journalists and I thought, okay, that's not going to offend many people. Um, but, but, you know, if I, my, my, my parents were both ministers, you know, if I were in one of their churches, I wouldn't have talked the same way. Um, it, you know, and so, so if, if, if on your site you're upholding standards and saying, okay, we don't allow, you know, unsubstantiated accusations here, uh, you can be pretty firm and you can say, okay, we deleted that comment and, here, and here's why or something like that. And you, you know, the, it's your site, you can do that. But it, out on Twitter or Reddit, if somebody's doing it, rather than being the scold, uh, you know, we should ask questions and say, okay, how do you know that? Which is uh, a question journalists should always be asking. How do you know that? Or, or or sharing what we know and being a reasonable and, and using that place to establish our credibility by sharing what we know or by sharing our standards of asking tough questions about these accusations that are, that are being made. So I think context matters a whole lot. Well, what's your view? Have you still got the mic, by the way, Matthew? Do you... Yeah, go on. Molly's getting the mic. Add something. Um, I think there is value in being the scold, though, because you do need to have someone in there who's going to say, this is incorrect. And, and that actually raises the value of something like Reddit, if there's someone in there who's going through what's being said. Do you mean in Reddit or when it's, as you say, when both. they're coming into your house and Either. it's on the right? In both yep. places. Okay. Because yep. we should try to get yeah, Reddit. I agree. I agree. There, yeah. there were, um, Emily mentioned, there were a lot of people in Reddit, Reddit users, you know, challenging people who were posting these things. And I think the more people there are doing that, journalists or non-journalists, the better quality information you're yeah. going to get. Yeah. Um, and I know there were a couple of uh, journalists that I follow criticizing Reddit while it was happening. And I think Emily said, you know, well, why don't you go in there and create a subreddit or get into a subreddit mm. and start, you know, doing real-time verification, that's a service that you could provide instead of just criticizing from afar. Right, because I think it, it, has got, it has gained such a massive scale and so many people now look to Reddit mm. as a place for information that you need people to go in and fact check things that are said there because they often will spread outside of Reddit. People call Reddit the front page of the internet because people often go there and find mm. material to go write their own stories and some people even say that people steal a lot of their content by reading what's on Reddit. Can I, is there another question in the, uh, this idea there. Can I just, a very sort of, well, it's not gonna seem quick, but just to sort of follow on from that. Um, it, part of what Reddit does, and also the week before Anonymous with that awful case of the suicide of the girl um, who'd been gang raped. Mm -hmm. Um, it, part of their campaign and being vigilantes and posting these things and saying we know the boys that did this gang rape and the authorities are not doing anything, it, is it playing on a general sense, um, certainly in America and in, and in the UK, of a lack of trust in authorities? It's a global, a, a real sense that we can do this because the proper authorities, the police, journalists, aren't doing it for us. Sorry, I, it wasn't a very... But maybe yeah. you can answer, and then we come to your question. I don't think that's a new idea. I think it's always people have had some, um, had have always questioned whether authorities are doing everything they should be doing, mm. or maybe they're not looking in all the places they should be looking. Um, it doesn't mean that Reddit can replace um, authorities or journalists, um, but they could be a component that 
there can be a collaboration between the people who traditionally have done journalism or are, are professionals in the capacity of doing journalism. And I think we both need to work together. I think the crowd can continue to be a source of information. Um, but I think the real problem is that the professionals have to stop looking at something like Reddit and basically saying this is this is crap and we're not gonna mm. acknowledge that it exists because it does exist and it actually has a lot more influence than they realize. Yeah. And if they're not looking and confirming what's correct and what's incorrect, it's gonna cause more misinformation mm. than if they were to actually acknowledge it and go in and, and give some, some context and some clarity to it. Okay. Yeah. Alexandra Födal schmidt from the Austrian Der Standard. Um, two questions. One, how do you deal with the fact that a lot of persons who come and use nicknames? And the other question is, um, how much do you invest in your media companies in community management? Sorry, so there's two questions. The first was about a sort of anonymous um, commenting, exactly. so people without identities. And the, and the second one... Community management to moderate, for instance, uh, the commentaries. Emily, do you want to take the first one on anonymity? And maybe yeah. sure. Anthony and Steve can talk about the, yeah, the I moderation. Mean, so the old kind of um, push and pull about real identities. Uh, I've never been in favour of enforcing, uh, as it were, kind of uh, your own identity. The, the Facebook policy that says you have to be who you say you are. I think that it kills um, it, the opportunity for people who are genuinely scared uh, and disempowered um, from speaking out. Uh, if you enforce real identity policy. And I think that the lack of their voice is much more, um, if you like, it's, it's important to protect their opportunity to speak out more than it is to, as it were, keep a kind of clean and verified and easy to manage conversation for news organizations. I know that's not a popular answer and I know it's not easy to enforce. I feel very strongly about it. I don't think that... Um, I don't think that the, the enforcement of genuine identity does anything other than, um, yes, it raises uh, the standard of conversation. If what you mean is, you know, people are possibly more civil to each other, though, you know, I think, again, kind of that's debatable. I think it stifles conversation as well. Um, it's not an easy problem for uh, news communities to crack. Um, but I think that, you know, again, if your, communi if your community management is looking at reinforcing positive behavior and elevating, you know, good comments uh, rather than kind of playing whack-a-mole uh, and trying to sort of constantly kind of ha hammer down the trolls, etc., uh, you probably find that you make more progress than you will with a, with a, with a, with a real identity policy. Um, you too. Quickly, yay or nay to anonymity and the issue of moderation that was... Um, I, uh, we're still wrestling with the anonymity thing. Uh, you know, we, we have editorial pages where we don't sign our editorials. Uh, and, and we grant confidentiality to a lot of sources. So, so for us to, to simply say, no, no, you can't do that, mm -hmm. just because we require signatures on letters to the editor, you know, it's it's not as as cut and dried as we would like, but but I think that but I favor accountability and and ways to maybe reward accountability. You know, that if if people use verified identity, I'd like to see software that allows those comments to go to the top, and you know, and mm. you got to dig deeper to get the anonymous crap or something like that. Um, we we have significant uh, moderating and, and joining the conversation is a significant responsibility in our newsrooms we handle it a lot of different ways I could go into more detail but I don't think we have yeah. time we know that even if people put their name 
on comments, they still say really horrible things. There's actually <laughs> websites devoted to showing the horrible things that people post under their real names with Facebook Connect allowing you to use Facebook as your commenting system. People do it. So I don't think uh, uh, putting people's real names to comments ha actually helps raise the level of discourse. Okay. Um, so I think it's just the, the, the role of the community manager is very underrated. Um, and I don't think there's any way to really cultivate an excellent community unless you have someone actively managing that community. We've probably got time for one more question. Um, this lady here. And I also want to you to be thinking of who you think is the best in the field at community management in no news organizations. And if you're just naming one, you can't just name your own organization. Um, sorry. Domanda per Anthony De Rosa. Oh. Sorry. E, yeah. Yeah. Ok. E, allora, siccome io poi ho fatto, ho fatto una tesi qualche tempo fa sul, proprio sul rapporto tra le agenzie di stampa e i social network e, e ho visto, ho potuto vedere la differenza abissale che esiste tra le agenzie mondiali o comunque anglosassoni e quelle italiane. Quello che mi chiedo è il, qual è il senso e il valore di creare una, una comunità per un'agenzia di stampa che ha la maggior parte diciamo, degli introiti da abbonamenti, quindi da testate, da giornali, da istituzioni e, e se questo poi può essere il primo passo, però il primo passo di, di quel cambiamento che in Italia diciamo, eh, stiamo ancora aspettando proprio per evitare l'estinzione delle, delle agenzie di stampa come avevi scritto qualche tempo fa in un articolo. Do you want to explain to people that don't have the sure. translation? Sure. So the question was, um, why should press agencies like Reuters have communities at all? Because their business is to sell the news to other um, newspapers, uh, television. Um, the answer is there are actually two sides to Reuters. There is the side of the business that's selling their news to places that uh, publish it in their own platforms. There's also Reuters.com and our own consumer business, which is what I am involved with. So uh, think of us as almost a, a client of the wire service that Reuters is producing. And we are trying to be as good, if not better, than the people that we're selling the news to. And part of that is having a very vibrant, rich um, community that we not only engage and listen to, but try to make part of the content that we're producing. So I think what we're trying to do is uh, be an example for why, uh, hopefully we can provide an example for the Italian uh, press agencies that you mentioned uh, to do the same, because I, I feel like we have, um, through articles that have been written and people who speak about Reuters in a, in a positive way because of the way that we build our community and we listen to, to our, our readers and we, we are active on all these different social platforms. So if anything, I hope that is a good example for the Italian press agencies to do the same. Um, if it's a really short question, you can. Can I have You can. Oh, sh maybe shout. If you just, if you shout, I'm sure we can hear it from here and we'll, yeah, we'll say. Um. <laughs> It's a question for Anthony De Rosa, um, and it's probably a conclusive question. And I'm not expecting an extensive answer, but since you're talking about the credibility of Reuters and how uh, that helps building communities, I mean, can you make a comment on uh, what has happened, the incident of uh, Matthew Keyes being uh, uh, dismissed because of his uh, conduct on social networks? I would love to. Oh. Am I on? Okay. I would love to comment on it. I can't right now because it's still an active, ongoing uh, investigation, both uh, with him and the union and with the, the indictment. So at some point I will be able to comment, but right now I can't, sorry. Okay. So as a final act, I'd like each of the panel. Hey, that was a very nice, quick, quick answer. <laughs> Although as a journalist, I never like the, I can't comment, obviously, yeah. because none of us do. Um, but as a final comment, can you each say, if we're talking about building communities um, in news organizations, which is the one outfit that you think it's doing really well and why, and you're not allowed to say your own organization, or the Guardian in your thinking, so. 
the Guardian is very good. Huff, Huffington Post is excellent, uh, and 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 the New York Times does 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 a lot of good things. And if that, you say why, what are they? You know, what's the sort of? Is it numbers? Is it? Uh, I. Each of each of them is. I, I think they're all very experimental. Th th that's what what I like best is is the experimental. They, you know, not everything they do works, but but they're trying some very cool things. Anthony, I, I would echo all those three. I would also add uh, the Gawker Network because they're so committed and and almost uh, in a uh, way that could be to their detriment, want to make comments such a yeah. central point of what they're doing. The Kinja system uh, is something they built in-house, and they're putting a lot of investment into, and they're, uh, they're making that a big part of where they see their site going. So I think Gawker acknowledges that comments are very important, and they want to see what they can do to transform how comments work. Okay. Emily. Um, so I, cause you because you've stolen all of the ones that I was going to mention. <laughs> I'm going to mention a really controversial outlier, which is uh, Glenn Beck's The Blaze, um, <laughs> which nobody ever thinks about in um, liberal East Coast media, but which has, I think, is it 300,000 subscribers to a web TV channel paying $10 each a month, and whenever they ask questions about um, things like gun control, they get first of all 98% agreement, and B, I think they had something like kind of like two million responses on that. Um, and these are kind of things, you know. Th this is I mention it because I think I'm not, so, you know, it's not a community maybe anyone in this room would want to belong to. But you're not telling but, everybody but, you to know, go out it, and have a look. Yeah, but, but the, the, there are really significant communities of influence out there uh, mm. that you can't see and that, the, that aren't Gawker and aren't BuzzFeed and aren't the New York Times and aren't the Guardian and aren't people that you know, we would choose to spend our time with. Um, and quite often those are the communities that, that create and produce a uh, real surprise, um, and we would do well to uh, be aware and learn from them. Thank you. And on that, that note, I'd just like to thank you all for being a great audience. I thank the organisers. Thank Steve Buttry, Anthony De Rossa, and Emily Bell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I made loads of notes. That was very useful. That was great. Thank I made loads more questions.